enterprise configuration as a service. So I want to ask, first of all, who is here as professionals representing an enterprise? You? And who are here more out of interest? And then Mark, probably as a consultant, you get to influence enterprises as you go. Uh, okay, so I'll try to keep this balanced then. The initial audience is targeted for this presentation to an enterprise architects and enterprise professionals. Uh, so if I'm going too far one way or the other to say, hey, that doesn't apply to uh, we'll be good to go. Uh, what is enterprise? Oh, but first, I forgot about this slide. Because of what I am sharing with you is a cross cutting concern, and I've been in six or eight major Fortune 500 companies in the area, uh, I have to put this disclosure in here that I'm not going to be disclosing anything that is proprietary. But I am going to say the stuff you can find on the web and the personal experience. And I love logging and I love configuration management, cross cutting concerns. I've been thinking with that for a couple of decades now. So uh, a lot of it is just common knowledge. Display much over. So, an application consists of multiple parts. And we all know that. But if you have an application, the first thing you want to do, <coughs> the first thing that you have to do is put security in. Right? So, once security is in place, then you put instrumentation in place. And that would be your logging, monitoring, performance metrics, that kind of stuff. And oftentimes things get stopped there. And then finally, you have a third piece of the triad, a configuration. Configuration, we all know, is a bane of our existence. Every company does it differently. Oftentimes, companies do it multiple different ways. That's what they now. And we'll talk about that as we go. So our, our, our focus right now is, is going to be focusing on the configuration. So what is an enterprise? An enterprise, by the definition for this talk, is any group of computers or systems that you want to share configuration with. If you're not sharing configuration in your app with anything, sit down, enjoy the graphics, take this pizza, but it's, this is what we're talking about. The complexity of managing multiple settings across multiple applications. Configuration. What is configuration? People have all different kinds of concepts of what configuration is. We're not talking about colors on a screen. We're not talking about if Sandy can log in or Mary Beth can do this, this feature on that. We're talking about application runtime settings. So when we put it in at, at one of our, I'm going to use the word our or we, that's our generic aggregated institution that I can't talk about. But uh, when we put, put a configuration as a service in one location, we had people running up and putting their app settings in there that would say, uh, if you're calling to North Dakota, then do this. If you're calling to South Dakota, do that. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about buffer capacity, uh, connection strings, the number of, of characters that you might have for uh, an SMS, your, your keys, your uh, URLs for different uh, microservices. We're talking about that kind of stuff. So when I say configuration, Keep that in mind. This is the application runtime configuration. And then management. This is the enterprise piece. The, the configuration, we all know how to handle. You know, web configs or uh, app settings, uh, JSON, those type of things. But management is where the enterprise ish pieces come in. So we're going to talk about how we handle our settings, but also the management. How do we secure them? How do we manage them? How do we make sure that the right settings get put in the right environment at the right time? And that's, that gets really messy and hairy when people try to solve this problem in any different ways. That's what we're going to be talking about. So, as a service, so we're going to be focusing not on file management. We're going to be talking about, when I say service, don't, for those of you who are really into nomenclature, service can mean a lot of things. Service here means web service. Or lightweight, a DLL calling it a database inside your app. But typically, that's what we're going to be talking about. We're not going to be talking about a you can identity service or anything else like that beside your app. We can talk about that. So here are some core capabilities that most people want out of a centralized enterprise level thing. 
Centralized storage is the biggie. Particularly if you're going to Docker containers, if you're going to go to the web, you want your, all your configuration to come from a central place. That way they can automatically scale. If you're doing deployment on an on-prem environment, why worry about copying config files and transforms and all that stuff? Just full service, set your settings, you're done. Changes on the fly. Anybody argue about whether we should do that or not? Anybody want to do that? That seems to be the biggest thing. I want to be able to change something on a console, change the way my app is running at runtime. It could be that you're on the edge where I said that you know you should be or not be. But yes, you could type with that. But like log level could be a good example of that. Um, if you have Windows services running through a suite of, of servers and you need to change the uh, S3 package on that, you, know, you, should, you, should, you might be able to post, push that without restarting all your servers. That kind of concept. Yeah, yeah. The buffer, you know, some sort of internal function that you want to do. Uh, most people are talking about logging. That seems to be the, the nine, eighth of the time. I, I want to be able to, on that server, I'm having problems. On that application running on that server, I have problems. So I want to just turn on the logging on that particular instance of that app running on that server so I can see what's happening. I don't want to turn on debug logging on, on seven different servers and watch my log files go up, but I want to be able to precisely identify those. All right, so before we get into this slide, who is fussed with the configuration? All right, so for those that you have, what are the things that you want out of configuration? Just what problems I do encounter? That, yeah, okay, so some sort of control. tell you from first experience that I got a call from my boss who got a call from his customer saying, why are you sending me all these test emails? All right? So that's, that's what the mess we get into. From an enterprise standpoint, here are just some of the things that my clients talk to me about. Um, they want to be able to have some centralized library that's compatible with all frameworks that's running inside the environment. If you're in a small shop or smallish shop, you have pretty good control over that. Pete and I have come to shared the experience of serving together on two different places. In one place, they're still on four bytes. So if I build all the cool stuff and compile it to four six, all of our apps aren't going to run. There. So in another place, I wrote this cool library. I just started there. I was all excited. I went and did this stuff. Worked on three apps. Pushed it onto our NuGet repository, it crashed because there was a downstream dependency on the .NET 2.0. So that this is why we wanted to talk about the enterprise stuff. How do we manage that? Uh, version tracking: who changed what when on the setting. Now, for this is important from an enterprise standpoint. Uh, let me see. Usage at a glance: we want to find out which settings are being used and which are not. What happens when I touch that setting? What does it affect? That's a very important thing from an enterprise standpoint. That institutional knowledge oftentimes walks out the door with the developer that wrote it. And then you don't know what happens. What happens if I change authorization equals yes to authorization equals no? Everything yes, it may be good, it may be bad, it may be nothing. We don't know what it does. Uh, if you get the slide deck, you can make the rest of those. I'm not gonna more used to that. So from a developer standpoint, as I write code, these are the things I want. If I'm starting a new project, I don't want to mess with configuration. I want to, you know, my, my boss is looking at how many story cards I'm, I'm running through off, off the board. And if it takes me two days to set up my project, it makes me look really bad. So I don't want to do that. I want to make it, it should, I should set it up quickly and it should just work. One of the things that is missing on every configuration platform that I see, that 
I want is I want to have people put comments on the configuration set. What are the, if I say uh, feature flag equals loss, how do I know what that feature flag value is supposed to be? One, two, three, four, five, A, B, C, D are the codes. You don't know what those are supposed to be. I would like to see as a configuration consumer what these are supposed to be. And if, if I see, oh, there's a connection string, I'm going to use that connection string. But really, that belongs somewhere else. And then it gets all messed up when they change. So that's what I want. I want it to be fast. I want it to be. I want it to be. Uh, I want it to be uh, reliable. And then, if I'm using some sort of service, I want to be able to override it. I'm working from home. I'm working on a desktop. I'm deploying it just on a local box. It's not part of the infrastructure. I want to be able to override the settings that I'm getting from the central service, so I can make it work locally. Or if you have a staging environment that needs to set up for a hot fix environment, you can just tweak things along the way. And this is the last one. Is never seen it. I would love to have it. It's a temporary configuration entry. I can turn on debugging in production, and if I forget to turn it off, it will turn itself off. Uh, a feature. You might turn on a feature flag today. It doesn't come active until the day after tomorrow because you have production for seven days. You can do the setting, you can set all that up, push it out, and then it becomes active in the east. Or you have a Christmas, a Christmas holiday thing, and you want that to turn off the day before Christmas. So instead of remembering how to do that and how to do a deployment, I want setting it automatically. I've never seen that before, but I think it would be cool. From an operation standpoint, these are the guys that build the infrastructure. They have a concern about this. One other thing is managing multiple environments. How many people have trouble moving apps between environments? I have. You know, getting the right settings at the right time, deployed at the right environments. That's difficult. I want to keep developers out of configuration. But he was saying, you know, I don't want them messing with my, my runtime. I, my, my boss is looking how reliable my systems are. Developers are going there monkeying with my configuration and breaking things. I don't want that. Um, I want to be reliable. I want your stupid app, you write this developer, to be able to run in my container environment or my service fabric environment or in my Amazon environment, which I don't know. Serverless hosted environment, the Lambda environments. I want I want my app to run to get their configuration in that environment without having to recompile everything and redeploy everything and, and make make an active thought. I want to be able to roll back and I, I especially want to know which apps are using what configuration. As an operations guy, if I'm going through and making sure that things are secure or stable or whatever, and I say I find four connection strings all to the same database, I want to be able to tell which ones I'm using, and I gotta know which app to use. One environment I was at, we had 65 entries in our service, all pointing to the exact same database. So figure that out. All different names, and sometimes the same name was used to point to two different databases. That's what drives the uh, uh, operation to pay nuts. So for management, management is where the enterprise is. So if you guys are interested in the management, we can slide past the management slide, slide decks. But essentially, they're the people that pay the bills. They're the guys that work and worry about GDPR, and HIPAA, and, and, and PCI compliance. But you know, credit card compliance. Um, they changed a couple years ago, and then so you know they want to be able to find out who changed what. They want to find out which apps are using what settings. They want to be able to approve the changes if it's approved. They want to be able to say, "Okay, Mr. Developer, you can't put an item in production. You can request an item to be in production, just like a pull request." Um, the biggest thing there is non-repudiation. How do I know for sure that that setting is exactly the way it's supposed to be? Uh, your auditors will say, can I go in there and change that setting? Which is strange, because who would be doing that? They go actually check the CRC codes and all kinds of different audit, audit things to make sure the configuration is good. 
He's all part of a configuration story. Now, here's some benefits. Who uses a centralized configuration system now? Yes. Do you use one? Progressive? Uh, I would love to pick your brain some of it without breaking any confidentiality of this. Yeah, well, you're using a centralized configuration system. Uh, can you share a little bit what, what it does? Stored in a database, or how? How? Okay. Cool. Some a lot of this is not new. I'm not selling you a new thing. Snake will sort of survey what configuration options you have. You do have some of that. But it's not as robust. We'll come back and type it. Okay. Uh, if you right click and choose publish in your app into Azure, it will take your local configuration settings. But if you have the wrong, if they give you permission to right click and publish in production, now you got a dead set. What happens if somebody else wants to reference it and say, hey, they will have the same key. And then also means that your, your setting key, your credentials, your username and password, if you're not using integrated security, your keys to third party service, if you use Twilio or some other sort of payment service, all that stuff in your web page web page. So when you click you know, debug or production or, or stage, and it builds those sort of files. Web config that the web config for the apps and environment. That will then leak sensitive information across your source code. I didn't sort of only prove that you you are who you are, but did not verify what you can across the chain. So there's there's a lot of things there that we can talk further, but you know, you're right. It does some of it. So sometimes you can just take steps, and sometimes just a right click and keep publish. It's, it's sufficient to do that. But we're talking bigger scale for this at the moment. Uh, CI CD type pipelines, many of you are using Azure DevOps. Uh, if you use the centralized configuration store, that way it, it when it starts building your test unit test packages or anything else like that, it, it will it will deploy automatically for you. You don't have to worry about top, copying a file and that kind of thing. Again, we mentioned containers and microservices. If you've ever set up a Docker thing with the file in .NET, you have to mount a, a third-party volume and then copy those, those things into your Docker, into your Docker volume, all that mess. You don't want to do that. You want to be able to say, go get my configuration, stop using files for configuration, and then your Docker Shut down. Uh, if you have a service provider, and we'll talk about those, Azure and, and AWS both have a configuration service. If you use those, they handle all the encryption for you. Encryption at rest, encryption on the channel. Uh, it gives you a lot of ability then to go with the system. You don't have to manage it. If you write your own configuration as a service, you have to handle that. Not, it's not hard, but it's just something you have to make sure that you uh, the other thing is management and review. How many times is it used? By whom? And which app are using it? Which hosts are using it? So if you have a, a security instance, you can oftentimes trace that back in your usage log to find out, did I really give a connection string that's out in the public that wasn't supposed to be there? Um, and that kind of thing. So that's the benefits of centralizing access versus distributed access to your tech. You can like this, you control everything, now you can monitor it. You can manage that. Yes. 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 Absolutely. I have I have a slide in here. It's uh hashy for question marks. So I haven't used it, but exactly it has the key vault in it. It has the key value store conjure is tied into the hashy for. Uh, 
So it's a nice little package if you want to use open source packages. To do this. That's that's our goal. That's the goal of this one. You have the concept precisely. So the downsides to adapting a, a configuration of the service. Not everything is, is as good as it seems. The biggest thing is it has to be extremely high availability. If your app starts and tries to reach the service and it's not there, what happens? That's really, really bad. And the three of us have shared shared uh, our blood and sweat and tears at times. We have found that that has happened. Critical services with identity service. It went down. And all their apps stopped working. You know, and configuration do the same way. Unless there's other alternative strategies that we're still talking about later. All right, moving on. Visibility and impact analysis. This is the big one. Remove everything in its centralized configuration store that's remote. How do you know what your app is actually using? What settings is it running on? Uh, we actually worked in, in, in Peach Group at one time, which we won't go with. Uh, but we couldn't figure out why it was running. So I'll, we'll show you a screen later on that we, oh, wait, our connection screen. But we didn't. It was coming out of a centralized configuration. And it somehow it was stuck in the wrong patch. It turned out to be something in the patch. So let's get that screen. Mistakes we have learned. Remember, the we is an aggregate of all these companies that I've worked with this concept with. Keep it out of the box as much as possible. You were saying, out of the box. Right-click, publish. If it fits your use case, and you don't have a use case to move away from it, don't. Stay, stay simple. You know, if you're going to use the web config, configuration manager, that app setting, if you're on framework. How many people are only on framework? How many people are only on core? A couple people on core. And then most of us are on private hybrid. It's a strategic decision, so if you lead your company down a centralized configuration store, it has to be from management down because there's, in, there's a cost to servers, load balancers, databases. It becomes a core component like identity server on your platform and you have to be able to manage. If you don't make that commitment or you don't have that commitment, don't go down the problem. It can't be done halfway. It can be fun. It's a lot of fun trying to take a mess and clean it up. At least that's what I like. So it is a lot of fun. Uh, migrating is actually migrating from a distributed platform with a lot of different files and stuff to a centralized platform is tough, but not tough technically. It's tough culture. Developers hate change. And they will find out ways to do it. And honestly, people have spent hours writing their own special configuration manuals. So every every single we have two of them in, in my in the app that, that you and I shared just now. You know, Bill went out all his own stuff, right? Everybody has written their own configuration management software. And this effort, if you're moving to a centralized system, is moving the company to a single way of handling configuration management. Radioactive, wisdom is learning from the mistakes of others. But it's very alluring, it sounds good, let me put it all in one place, we do all this stuff. It's expensive. Make sure you have time and energy of both people and money to be able to put this down. Uh, you just can't just put this out on a desktop server and let it go and be happy. Uh, there's not a lot of traffic on one of these computers and service things, but once the app starts, it doesn't need to call it again. But it's you have to make sure it's redundant. You've got RAID drives, you've got load balances, two or three servers, making sure it all handles failures. And it gets made that it's disruptive. Um, and it can impact the business more than you expect. Because as you migrate, go ahead. I didn't say that. I, didn't, I said, I said close. Uh, but you're right. Go ahead with your question. And that's and the, the strategy is, uh, in fact, Microsoft has, if you look at the Azure App Config Connector, they have a default of five minutes. So it calls them back to the service every five minutes. It calls back to Azure for every five minutes, we'll get its configuration back to the app. 
viewpoint. Yes, there is traffic. Yeah, so there's a timer. Uh, there, I mean, the, the app for Azure has a built-in timer. Uh, and we'll talk about that, and then I'll, I'll demonstrate that exactly. But if you have 100 apps calling back home every five minutes, you got 500 calls over five minutes. That's not. You can do that on a laptop. So there's not a lot of strain. Uh, but you do have to call back. All right, so what are, what's out there? Let's move on. I like this quote from Pat, Journal Patton. Wars may be fought with weapons, but they're won by men. We can't just throw technology at a problem and expect to solve it. It's people. It's a, we just got to solve and, and work with the engineers and, and the, the DevOps people. People that are doing the daily job. And then that will make it work. So what, what do we have out there? Web configs. Everybody familiar with web configs? Yes? Yes? If you don't know web configs, you haven't been in .NET very long. Um, web config transforms. I think that's what you're talking about. You have a production version versus a, a staging version. You can set your configuration to make, to make some changes. Uh, Slow Cheetah, which was starting as an independent product, but it fixed such a big hole that now it's hosted on Microsoft GitHub account. Um, it basically does web, web transforms at compile time. Usually transforms are only done at publish time. And this helps with that. Layer configuration, we'll get into that. Uh, this is all .NET, cool things. So if you don't, if you have a configuration problem, you may not have to go all the way to centralize the service. There's a lot of choices that you can do to build your design. How many of you are familiar with the .NET layer of configuration? We'll, we'll just make this real quick. Um, You started the machine config. That's down in your system 32 folder. Or it, it's buried in your Windows folder somewhere. Uh, that's the technical answer. Anything that's in here will flow down through. So if you have a common thing on your machine, a like connection string to database, you can put it here, and every .NET app in your box will pick up that connection string. Environment variables on .NET are different than the environment variables on You can put registry settings down there. You can put, uh, like I said, connection strings, uh, logging levels, whatever you want. But in .NET, Windows service or in uh, uh, IS service, we're going on that. Web config are only for web. And you can put some glo like global HTTP handlers. Uh, you want to put a foot on it. Better every website that's posted on your box. Look like put it. Tracking information, tracking handlers, and go all that. Now this is all on a per box basis. So if you have a box that hosts 15 websites, they all get that capability right now. It's a great way to share configuration. Web configs, we're all happy with that. And this is what's not used very often, but if you put a web config in any folder and they call configuration manager dot, it will pull that those that so if you have like a, again a Christmas promo, you say enabled or disabled, and set that flag in that folder. And if that value is in there, it will do what you need to do. Quickly, uh, we talk about files. You can use the file equals miles settings. How many people know what symbolic links are? That was something I didn't know until just three months ago. But it's really cool because you can actually put alias on your operating system. Go out and read your configuration files. A different way to, okay, if I have 18 different apps, we can all go to the same folder by using symbolic links and we're good to go. We can all share the same configuration. All right. What's really cool though is .NET 4.7 introduces this thing called configuration builders. Configuration builders are the .NET core of equivalent for uh, framework. Essentially here, this is a really good thing. If you're thinking of writing your own custom configuration platform or some sort of client, this is where you would hang into it. Uh, you can define your different stores. Uh, right now, out of the box, uh, Azure, Azure Key Vault, there's the open source ones available for AWS parameter service, JSON, do whatever, things like that. So that's, that's nice. You don't have to write any of your own code. You've got the files, links it up, and you're done. Um, tokens. Tokens are something that people don't use very often. 
So they introduce tokens in, into the configuration management so that if you have a token that says my database and you're going into my approved database, you can put one token referencing another one and that way you don't have to worry about uh, your app rate. You can change it later. But then you're using the approved version and not the, the unapproved version. The gradients, uh, gradients trick will skip that, but it essentially says how, how much data I want to get from Azure or any other configuration that you built. And then it loads these in order, just like uh, .NET Core. So it's going to load the environment variables, overwrite, overwrite them with any my config store variables, blah, blah, blah. So you're, you can tweak how much data you're going to get from your various services. Very nice .NET 4.7 capability. If you can't go to Core on your, in your enterprise and you're on 4.7, that's a good way to grow your configuration. If you're not, if you're on the other one, if you're not on Core 7, you can actually come over here, and there is somewhere in here a. I'm looking, I'm looking. You have to go into .NET, reflect across the, the internal providers, turn off the read-only flag. I don't know Turn off the read-only flag, set all your variables, and turn the back again. Better work. And you can set your configuration settings on an even less than four, four seconds. Security? Anybody that encrypted connections? Nobody. Oh, you. One person. Did you, did you use it somewhat? Some encrypted connection strings are rarely used because they were a pain. And I liked it, but... Then when you started the deployment and you had to write power shots just to make sure that you could fix it was common with everything. Or you had to make sure your machine keys were done and then they spent up a new server or different you know, machine keys and so on. So it you don't see it used a lot, but essentially it scrambles your config file in a generic set. You use it online, but you know what I'm saying. And that way it uses the AES two thirty six encryption. You can't it just looks like gobble goop. The operating system on encryption. Great way to secure your stuff. This is good if you like calling payment service and have all your credentials uh, it, or your database credentials, whatever. Next. .NET Core, I'm not going to bore you. We, we've all been, if you've been using .NET Core, you're very familiar with these lines right here. Uh, these lines right here. You're, you're adding configuration. So, beware. Out of the box, there are like 70 classes and interfaces that for configuration. So as somebody who works in configuration, what you want to do is build your solution before you get to the developer. It takes all this stuff so your developers don't have to walk through all this. You want to walk that through for them, package it up, and deliver it in a tool. Microsoft delivers a framework, but we want to deliver a tool. So be aware of that. .NET Core doesn't have a lot of security. Frankly, it's kind of disappointing um, because they expect you to wire in other pieces, and you got to become a security expert in DPAI or user secret management. User secrets really are not encrypted. So you got to figure out how to encrypt the user secret store that's supposed to be encrypted, but it's not. It's the mess. It's the mess. Um, Azure App Configuration. Azure has launched a preview. Uh, that allows you to uh, put key value stores in their service. AWS has a really, really good one. It's called the Parameter Service. And we'll look at that in a minute. In Azure, here's it by example. Here's a bunch of keys and values. So they have this centralized configuration store part of it. So if you're in the cloud or you have access to the cloud, this may be all that you need. I would recommend you look at that. You don't need all the other management and the, the control, and the security, and the authorization, and the approval workflows, and all the other stuff you need to enterprise, this is a great place to start. And then you combine that with a couple other things, you have local and remote, you have local and local. AWS has a system manager parameter store. It is excellent. So if you have access, if your company can access AWS, I'm an Azure guy, but this is the way to go right now. Azure, Azure settings is on preview. This is rock solid. It has very, it's very complicated. If you need complicated scenarios, 
very simple use for You can lock it down on a per setting basis or on a per tree basis. You can monitor stuff. It gives you all the versions as you change things. You can back to the old version work. All, all that stuff you want. So, here's an example. It gave you who was modified and when it was modified. It gives you all the history. Uh, here's the hash profile. I haven't used it. I've read about it. I uh, see that it has a lot of capabilities that all the big players have. Uh, key vaults, key storage, key value pair storage, logging, uh, that kind of thing. And then there are other third parties that integrate with this. Uh, so if you have Linux experience or you have it, that capability in your, in, your, in your thing and you're not on cloud, it's probably worth it. Yes. Yeah, it has an amazing API. So, it's, it's really good. Uh, but that's all I can say about it. So, building a, 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 a configuration as a service. This is where we get in the nuts and bolts of this work. Why we moved it. We, again, is the enterprise that's trying to move to a centralized storage. A lot of companies are trying to move to some sort of storage. Uh, configuration is a pain when you get start to scale. If you only do one or two apps, it's not too bad. It's a pain if you do otherwise. Uh, sensitive information everywhere. Like I said, we had database connection strings and usernames and passwords. One place I was at, within a half an hour, I was on production because I spread the, 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 the configuration keys. I went to the database, select star from, they had a configuration database of some sort. Where were they? Oh, there it is. I didn't go there, but I could have. Half an hour. That's not very really good. That should keep people, the security professions awake at night. People can do that. Uh, if you're moving to cloud, container, anybody working with a cloud strategy, I mean a container strategy, or service pathway, or app settings, that kind of thing, you'll find that moving to some sort of simplified service works better. Uh, compliance is becoming an issue. GDPR is a big one. GDPR, if you fail it, they can sue you 10% 10, 10 of your gross revenue. Which means a company like Antrust, where I used to work, has a published uh, valuation of eight billion dollars in sales. All right, that's that's a billion dollars for not following their their security regulations, and they find major company in no way about that last year. It's not without reason that this type of thing is significant. And it's not only for that time, it's for every instance. So, yeah, it's important. Uh, inconsistency, uh, every team is building their own, bring your own configuration strategy, depending on what they wanted. It's just a minute. So we decided to centralize it. And this is what we came up with. We created, we created a custom client that would call our service. That service would store the data in either the cache and a database. Our goal is to create proxy API endpoints that we can take to Azure AWS commands and pass through here, capture it, monitor it, and then pass the values and let the cloud providers do the storing of the value. We're not there yet. But that's the idea. Um, which is very powerful. We're not going to use the UIs that the providers provide to do all my editing. And I can still get all the monitoring that I need. So that's the idea there. Uh, worked out pretty good. Uh, another firm that I work, I know, they don't have the cloud. They just have a database. They have a nice UI that you go up and in, look at the big things, changes, and move on. So, roadmap. If you do this pop thing, make sure you take the vet. Go down and make sure that you have an exact plan. You're ripping the guts out of your application. You're going to replace it with a different way. You better make sure that the head fits back on the monster that you take the chop off. And if you don't, it'll, it'll, it'll blow up. So take the time to do the plan. Uh, so what did, what did we decide? We, we are, are the, the, most people are in first gen of this. They're just moving off files, moving into this, or they've been on a file system or a database system that's been growing over the years and they're ready to rip it out. This is where the industry is. 
We want a client that's simple. If you put publishers to our local Google store or something like that, we can use. Uh, client must have a fallback source. If I can't connect to the source, my app better start with the last sentence that I had. So somehow connecting to the, another database, connecting to a, a Redis hash, connecting to the file, but somehow an alternate one or two of the string can happily start regardless. Visibility is the big one. And then from a service, uh, restricted database, access to the API. We have situations where people are in their production code, we're writing right to the configuration store, and using it as a key value store. But that's not really what we had in mind. And, or they would put the CSS style sheets in there, or weird things that they can just store in there for whatever reason. Uh, we want the API service to be the API service. Encrypted files at rest. When we started encrypted files at rest, nobody's right to them because they don't have our encryption. And that kind of broke a lot of things. And that's how we took a long time to get everybody in the right channel. Um, so patterns and practices. If you're doing one of these things, like I said, you're ripping the head off the monster. You may as well put it back on right. And so you look at bad practices and, and that's the path up and up. So this is what we came up with for visibility. This can happen on any app. It doesn't have to be a configuration of a server app. So this is what we have running on some of the, the our endpoints. Um, I want to point out, I got my slide backwards. Right here is important. Security is paramount. So if you're creating a an app that is going to go slash configuration in your websites, that will dump this runtime configuration, you had better make sure that nobody else can get to it. And so we came up with all kinds of weird ways of doing it. We read the assembly info file. Get the glue from the assembly that has to match a parameter. We put some timestamps on it. It's up to you to make sure that it's it's stable. Uh, but you got to make sure that your your call is correct. Right now, I have no security. But notice, I get my app settings and my connection strings and all that kind of stuff. What I want to point out, maybe certain time, there it is, right there. You sanitize all your critical stuff before you. And that is the biggest thing that I have to fight with. It, that you have to sanitize your, your client ID secrets and your database passwords and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so it's whatever algorithm you come up with. But basically what I said on my side was anything that works with password, and if I find password in that string, from, from that D to the end of the string, I just throw it away. Replace it with a bunch of passwords. That's, that's what I did. Uh, that means when I create my, I had to refactor my connection strings so my password was the last field, but that was small potatoes. Th that was very helpful that way. This works in .NET Core as well. You look down here, ASP.NET Core environment, that's our environment variables coming in. So th this concept works the same way in Core. And then here is your app settings.json file, log level information coming here. So it's easy to see what's going on. The other thing that you can do, which is kind of a compromise, is that you can write off to a log file. So now you're telling the app, dump your configuration. You give it some, in that log message, you give some ID that you can find it, search for it. And now you sanitize it, but the caller can't see it. So if I get hacked, they also have to hack the log. And so that, that's a good compromise that way. The other thing is when the app starts, it can push its configuration into, into the log. Every time the app starts, it writes the its configuration onto the log, again sanitize. And that's helpful too because you need to find out which app started and which host and that kind of thing. It's a nice connect way and then you know what it's running. So let's skip that. This is our goal. We want to have a configuration file that looks like that. Four lines of code. The web can think. JSON file thing. I think, yeah, I have a JSON example for, for app settings. In a pure configuration as a service, that is what you want. Everything else can be done from the server. Then when I'm deploying, all I have to do is change, you know, like a client ID in secret, 
In this case, I don't have a client ID secret. I'm using an identity server, so I'm going to just give my application name and environment name and tell them. That's that's all you need. There should be. There should be here. Oh, on this on this setting itself, it should be. That was that was bad on my part. You're absolutely right. Yes. You could create a custom configuration section. Yeah. It's something. But I, I often I just put comments in my app. And you can also comment the JSON file, the whack whack network. Alright, so you're right. Now, so how do you access an application? What we found was that many developers use configuration manager. Now again, I'm using configuration manager because that's my mode I'm in, but .NET Core is the same thing. You can use I options. Right? So uh, but configuration manager .app settings not authorized. That's a really bad key. What does that mean? Are we redirecting to it? Is it true or false? Whatever. But we're not worried about that. We're more, more like access. This is a bad access pattern. You see this in your code, you should rip it out and run into running more streaming. Because now you can't do that. Because now it's depending on some sort of global thing that is dependent there. So, well, you can't. It's more difficult. Um, and then really, should be a config setting. If you're in there messing with the, the, the enterprise configuration setting, most enterprises have a thousand to fifteen hundred. They're not many. They're really not that many out there. Um, so does it really make sense to do this? I wrote a system and I over engineered things really badly. Uh, and I will be admit that that was my first I still struggle with that. But the last project I had, we had sixty configuration settings to make sure just in case somebody wants to change it sometime. Well if somebody make a call, let's take a choice, and then cut that down by I you know, Done fine. Really, that should be no more than five. But just hyper configurable, but that makes it stupid. Not me. So, that should be really a config setting is the question to be asked. So, here's another alternative. Notice I have created an app config class that has my settings in it. And then when, I, when it gets newed up, it's called configuration manager app, app, app settings. That's good. That's better. How many people use this pattern? They use a, some sort of thing. Nobody's using this pattern. Oh, a couple people are. Um, this is a nice pattern. You can now inject this after big block into your code, and it works. You don't have to, and then all your configuration manager, that app settings, or connection strings, or whatever, is in one place. Not bad. Here's another alternative. This is something that I learned a couple years ago. I should have been up on it, but I wasn't. Uh, it's been around since.NET. Five. You can put a lambda initializer on your property. So in this case, every time I recognize not authorized URL, it's going to configuration manager. Not not just when it gets to the application starts. Every single time I access that property, it goes to configuration manager. So if configuration manager updates the settings. Now my settings are up to date. In the prior thing, this is only done at boot time with the equal sign. In the boot, then you only get it once. Sometimes you, you don't want it to change. But for the most part, you're going to want it to change dynamically. That works fine. I used to think that calling configuration manager dot app seven is slow. After I'll cache that. But that was that's intention. That mistake that you're a good good call. I want to. I want to show you why. No, this is this, this is not production code. This is actually on a demo site that's on GitHub, which I'll show you the URL later. Um, but this is intentional. Now I all I have to do is change it in one place. My code doesn't have to change. Whatever you put it on my on this, it's not authorized URL. It doesn't have to change. The other advantage of using like what you're doing this this concept of a, a block of code is I can refactor my configuration settings so. It tracks with my knowledge of my app. Apps change, especially new apps. You think you're going to call them items, then you call them treats, then you're going to call them wood, and then you have to go back and change everything or leave old stuff there. 
But by putting it in one place, it's easy to refactor. So it's got that, you know, Visual Studio. You right click, it says rename, boom, you're done. Uh, so it helps you with that. Moving on. Uh, so this is my, what I recommend. If you can, inject your configuration into your app, into your classes, into your controllers. That way they can be testable. I don't test controllers ever, but I have library classes that I test. And I want configuration or I need configuration set in the library. So you can use dependency injection, or when it moves up, you can access it somehow. If you don't have access to dependency injection in your app, a lot of times you don't, click on legacy code. Uh, I created all my apps have a app back global file. It's where I put all my global configuration. I know globals are bad, but everybody knows that they, they need the location. I put them in this global class. So now I have a my app config, and I can reference it here. Notice I have a base controller config equals my app globals that config. Arrow that means I'll get a fresh copy whenever I need it. And then I can reference it in my code power in it. Now to your point, I put comments on those on those pieces. So now here I have it's no authorized. That's the key. I, I intentionally that bad. So that I know that I have to reference the no authorized component in my app set. And there's a default. So that's my pattern that I use. Uh, on all my configuration. This seems to work pretty good. And then if I need to change it to not authorized, update my comment, and now everybody knows what that value is. Uh, strong UI is really important. If you don't, if you're going to a centralized configuration management system and don't have a strong UI, it will fail. Yes, I got a strong API on it. No. Developers don't care about making out in different post games called updated configuration. They want to go there, edit this, change this, it's done. And that's what the simplicity that you have to drive at. If you're going to go through a, a, a Apache Corp, if you're going to go through Azure or AWS or your own, make sure it has a strong UI. If it doesn't have a strong UI, it won't work. That's just practice. That's just practical. I prefer on a, something as simple like this, forget view, forget Angular, forget the latest spa framework, do it MVC and Rachel. Because it's an internal app that's only going to be used by your developers, and you want to get it out there as quickly as possible. It doesn't make any sense to do anything. It costs you money, don't do it. That's my thinking on something you can fill the app like What do you need? Do you want search? Do you want to be able to search for things or not? If you only have 100, 150 settings, you can scroll. Why write a search capability? If you have 150,000 settings, then it probably makes sense. Do you need approval workflows? Some some companies, like they want developers to be able to put a production request in for an app update, but then have a manager sign off on it. So you don't get into mistakes and pushing the wrong thing. You want to have a second set of eyes. Kind of like a pull request, you can either approve or deny a pull request. Uh, access appropriateness. It looks like this. I can care less about access appropriateness. Access appropriateness means that if I have a setting, every year somebody validates that, that setting is what it's supposed to be. Hey, welcome to, for let's say SAP or, or or ADP or whatever like that. You're internet internet facing this. You want by audit standards, you want to make sure that that setting is still being used. And by and that's do you want that? If you don't need that. Don't write your own. So these are the things, these are the things you go through. Usage reporting. If you don't need any of these things, don't use your own custom configuration stuff. Why do I give it the talk about how not to do it? Because sometimes you need this stuff, but I don't want to lead you down the wrong way. As an engineer, I love a centralized configuration. It's exciting. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. I can do all this cool stuff. You don't need it. So why? Just use the stuff that's available. Because the UI is such a fundamental competitive block, I could take the UI from my different experiences. So here's the model. Uh, essentially simple. I mean, like I said, it doesn't have to be hard. Uh, but some of the cool things you can have is 
it tells the manager how many tools they have. I always use an Active Directory login, something like this. If you don't have Active Directory login, you can use OpenID, but for open, uh, Active Directory, so that we can we can control complete access to to the website. Um, let's see what else we got? The, and then that's that's pretty much it for that site. And then it lists the app name, environment name. Override will skip the key and the value. So right, it sounds pretty. Nothing, nothing complicated. This is not complicated science. What's complicated is getting it in place. I work with people. Then you have an editor. Depending on how, what you want to track, this is what you can do. Application name, environment name, the key and value, description. There's your description that we're talking about that I, I wrote in there uh, that they would put in place. Whether it's enabled or disabled, like I said, I've never seen that before. But since I was the guy writing the prototype, why not? Uh, and then the save comments. In, in my vision, that in order to save it, you can just like a pull request or commit, you have to have a, a comment about why you want that to be changed. Uh, history. If you don't need history, this doesn't mean nothing to you. But oftentimes you want to go back and see who changed what then. Because everything's encrypted in the database, you can't do a query against the database to find the data. Uh, so you have to write these these screens or reports so that you can see the data. Um, what would be cool is to be able to click on this as revert and just grab that the value and put it back. Uh, if not, you have to paste it. From an enterprise standpoint, there's this stuff I'm going to skip over because in it, this may not be applicable. But essentially, you have approvals, in, uh, encryption key rolling by by law. But if you're a publicly traded company, you have to roll, roll your encryption keys every year. If you don't, you get in trouble. Nobody does, but you're supposed to. Um, and then any random settings. So let's, let's get that set. If an administ if you're doing something that needs approval. And I, as a manager, get a list of 20 things to do. I don't want to open up 20 different emails saying, please go through the settings. So this is just a simple screen that you should consider going to a centralized system so that your, your, who's ever approving it, and he's in who deny, who deny, who deny. And it's a confirmation of email. So that, if they approve it, it gets sent to production. If they get denied, it's a nice little check to prevent things that you were talking about. Um, so that, that that goes that way. It's it's a puzzle. It's fun. Um, but skip if you start slowly, start thinking about it. Talk to your people. It actually is, it's, it's not too bad of a thing. The security, uh, centralized computer system, uh, access uh, configuration system. Security is paramount. If you don't live and breathe. And, and sweat the security on building your own uh, centralized configuration service, you need to. Uh, that's why I suggest going to Azure and the parameter service from AWS. Because you have to make sure that everything is locked down. Your entire enterprise is dependent on this. That gets compromised, they have access to the entire application. Not, not, a, not a good plan. Um, the other thing I is watching out for caching. You decrypt it, you cache the value. Oops, the cache is not even not so. so you have to encrypt it before you put it in the cache. Encrypt it when you get back out of the cache. Uh, and then make sure that your configuration store is not stored in the same database as your primary business store. It should be on a separate, hopefully a separate server. But if not, at least a separate data. Uh, improved patterns and factors. We've seen a lot of that. Uh, we've talked about that. I like the idea, uh, so the thing I'm going to show you later, is that common connection string uh, is shared. So if we have a, a database called My Business Database, right? And that now all my apps can reference one connection string called My Connection Database. And I have access, everybody knows that's where you go get the data. You don't have to figure out it's this one or that one or that one. Every resource that needs credentials and, and connection string is named by a well-known name. And all your apps reference it by that well-known name. I have never seen a database change or roll over in 30 years of doing this until last year. 
when the company I was associated with decided to change from uh, credentials to integrated security on all the database connections. Every one of those 80 redundant ones had to be updated. You know, that was just a problem. Or we lost the logging database, and now we have logged databases all over the place we have to update. With centralized shared things. That's what I. That's what an advantage is. A shared uh, name convention. All right. Again, it, 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 that's a, that's a philosophical thing. Some people would rather have all the connections for an application and not share that information. Between them. Uh, if you're if you're not we, we, we had moved with the database integra we had inter integrated security and all of our apps had a unique ID on them. So that, that exactly which app are going on which server was doing that. You're you're right. We have a shared connection string. But we were using exact same connection string on all of our apps. So it doesn't matter whether it came from app one or app two or app three. Connection string and credentials are all hard coded in across the board. That's not good practice. It's real, it's real life. Demo. What part is it? Right? You guys come to work? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 It is going to be a senior point of failure. Exactly. And that's why I'm recommending that if somebody wants experience, you build a NuGet client. We, we distribute our, our shared companies via an internal NuGet store. So if we have that shared store, I mean that NuGet package, it would have to be over logic in it. You can use the poly library for exponential back off, so if you're calling an API, it's down temporarily. You can call it that way. We have a good thread. We have good thing is that the thread is being actually generated on a separate thread. So if that thread crashes or times out via an HTTP call, it doesn't crash in the app. There's a lot of failover logic that has to be placed before the thread. That's why this isn't made for somebody that is just throwing this and hack overnight and saying, my God, it's got to be done. It's got to be tested. It's got to be tested thoroughly. Uh, it's also recommended Microsoft actually has folks on their Azure connection. They did implement it. Just there, but there's a fail, fail over. So if you as a, you can set that to a way to handle fail, right to the encrypted file or whatever it happens to be. Read from an encrypted file first, and then go get it your data. Or don't read it in the quick fail, and then but one way or another, you just maintain a cache copy in the whole block. So to your point, that's exactly what they're doing. And if it's not, it's not resilient. That's why you need. To Dual load balancers, at least two servers behind your load balancer. You know, you can get all kinds of things. That's why this is expensive if you're going to do it. Yep. Yeah, Azure has actually has some Azure architecture patterns book about 193 pages long, and it has a really good section on scalability, microservices, circuit breakers, uh, denial of service, and detection. Configuration is dynamic, it's actually built at the same time. So you would just update your database, your UI, whatever that is, that mechanism. Yep. Reviews. Yep.
that's up to you. No, not, I mean, I don't see that, but you're right. That, that is an issue. That is an area that I haven't encountered, but it doesn't make sense uh, to handle configuration changes as a set. But when when you go back to this slide. Right there. These are requests to go to production. Oh, it's like on a key by key basis. And so, There is an issue there. Uh, so far, in my experience, I'm not sure with this this much, compared to the old tools this much. But my experience is that most people can handle this, or the people that need to prove this to be your immediate manager, and they would know and you would just email them and say, hey, on this request, whatever. Uh, You, you could do that. You're basically saying, I'm going to try it. If it breaks, then I know it's wrong. Uh, but I think his point is, I don't want to wait that far down in, in, in the deployment cycle. Go to stage, it breaks. Or my tests aren't good enough, it doesn't pick this up, and I still go to production to this is set. You could. You could. I think, I think to his point, that, that looping, that set, is really what basically he's asking for is like a get commit. Here's all my changes that I want to be applied in this pull request. And group those together as a set and then uh, approve that pull request, that pull request into production. Yeah. So, yes, you are absolutely right. There are ways that we can get around it. But to his point, I think there's a missing component here from an enterprise standpoint. Of, of being able to take groups of, of sets of prices and put them in. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. People. Yeah, but uh, but at this point, I mean, it should, we should be able to say I, these sets are, are together. Or, you know, that would be nice. Yes. Unfortunately, many companies aren't sure enough to step up, including some major Fortune 500 companies in our in our area are not in the CXD level to be able to capture that in, in a practical, hands-on way. Yeah, or they're just too big. I mean, there's, I mean, I mean, like one one firm I know has over a thousand apps. So I mean, we, they actually pay. A consulting company, and they were in our, our, our house for three months trying to figure out all the dependencies and the links between all of our apps. They finally got it, but it was that complicated because it was years and years of all this stuff being built on. And to your point, that institutional knowledge would easily get forgotten by the next time the manager shifts. Uh, so yeah, there is there is a link. There's a there's a philosophical thing, but again, this is this pattern in this talk. Uh, I'm not selling you a solution. None of this is in code. Um, but I, I like uh, I like your point. It, it, to, to be enterprise-ish, a set-type base 
thing with a pull request that might be about our bike or our bike. Some sort of dependency maintenance. All right. So let's look at some, some demos. But before I do that, um, the demo that you're about to see has a cool capability. It's the fact that it has hierarchical settings. And this is what somebody mentioned this before. I wish it could, they said, I wish it could do. And in this case, it starts at the very top. And it processes these in, 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 a, in a giant SQL query. But this is just a demo, and you, you can pull my code out. There's actually a bug in this code. So if you did board some night, you can find it for me. But it's a demo, so I, I threw that out as a challenge. Um, but it pulls down all these key value pairs that only have an application that you provide. That way it's one setting shared across all your environments for your application. Buffer cycle, for instance. Or log level, your default log levels. Fill in the blank, whatever you want to use. It can be run across all your environments, but it's specific for that application. Then, if I'm working from home, I know my connection string is going to be from the server, it's going to come down to some database I don't have ability to, and I want to go localhost, I just create an override for Steve. So now I have an override on this particular thing. So the next thing it does is it comes down here and looks for environment. This is a powerful picture right here. You can share all your connection strings for an entire environment. Your Redis connection strings, database connection strings, whatever it is, per environment. So if I'm calling from the dev environment, I'm going to get all the dev connection strings. Don't take issue with the word also. But that, that's the idea, is that you can now have shared configuration, either at the app level or at the environment. This is pretty cool. You know, it makes things somewhat similar. You know, you, you don't have to repeat yourself all over again unless you want to, but you don't need to. Um, then we have the same thing. I can override any settings I want. This is where most of the stuff happens. You have an app name, an environment name, and that gives you your key value pair for that. Um, the demo encrypts its values. It has a three-tier inheritance. I have both a, a framework and a core demo. I'll finish up the core demo. Don't ever do this, guys. Finish it up at 6 o'clock tonight. So hopefully it'll acquire, but if it doesn't, it's cool. It does. It has an API to provide CRUD, but it, and it has the visibility UI. It doesn't do encryption key management. No security. If you use this in production, I will not hunt you down. I don't care. You know, it's it's not there. But it'll give you the idea about how to link this stuff together. All right. And if you want to get the demo code, it's, it's there at hashtag.net. And I only have two repositories up there. Is a WCF membership provider, which I think has been downloaded twice. And, you know, and then we have that one. So, demo time. This is uh, Visual Studio 2019. Nothing, nothing serious, but I have too much junk. I feel like I'm going to hospitals and all these wires. Um, so, let's just run this and see what I'm talking about. This one dot next for API is coming up. And there's my my four sprint example and my framework example. Which one looks prettier? So now if we go to our, our magic thing. This is four. And notice I've dumped an ASP done that four environment here. That's all of my environment variables. This, these, a lot of these are my environment variables. Uh, yeah. I'm not on the screen, but, but I can do that. You have to do it in the old fashioned way. Um, so, 
AC.NET Core environment are coming from your, your typical environment variables from .NET Core. Um, here's your connection strings. And right here are the connection strings coming from the database. So it's, as far as .NET is concerned, it all comes from the same thing. The demo has a custom configuration service with us the API. The API decrypts the stuff and continues to that. So, let's look at the same thing. Now we are in the .NET framework. The framework doesn't bring in all the environment variables. So, all we get is this. Um, but you notice here, last load time and the next load time, this is something my client has been injected into configuration if needed. But I can, if I refresh this, it should tell me that the next load time and the next load time is good. So we have this crazy thing called callback interval right here. Right? And this is in our framework. And what's my app name? My app name is I come over to our wonderful post now, and I post to that, and I'm going to create a new key, so that's all that key, and the value is going to be technically it says I've created my settings and carriers. Uh, if you were to do this in real life, I'd expect you to change your response text to match your, your own thing. Uh, now if we come back, if we did this right, we go to framework, and refresh this page, and there's our settings. Setting it doesn't reset the apple. You can do something like this. Which is cool, because now every five seconds, Right now, every five seconds, it's going back to the same. You have more stuff. You have more stuff. So just, it's just pretty cool. Now, this is where my API is bad. I should have returned an ID for this. But I can say, I will now go get. And I should find a new settings key in here. Thank you. Thank you, bud. I can't make it bigger. It, Postman doesn't make it bigger. Um, yeah, you don't you'll have to be big API. Callback interval milliseconds is 4,000. Right there. My goal is to reduce that to different numbers. Um, my bug is that I create duplicate records in the database. And so my database is I have any small back in the roll here. Um, okay, so that, that was a fail. Like I said, you don't wait until 6 o'clock the next morning. What I wanted to show you, though, is that using the API, I can update both .NET Core and Framework without the absolute reset on every 5 minutes or every 5 seconds. So that's pretty cool. So if you remember how you, uh, you update the web config, and even IS, you say, do not reload. It does. You know, so it's, it's kind of a, a, a nice way to do it. The database can support a semi complex environment is very simple. I can't make this any bigger, um, but maybe I can do it. Same.
See that now? Sorry about that. Um, the primary table is that. It is it's simply you have an ID, your three your three fields you, you have setting key, setting value. Setting value is binary, it's encrypted. And the rest of it is irrelevant. This is the audit table. The primary table is the same thing, except the audit table has he did he changed it. So now I have I use two tables. I have the ability to store hierarchical encrypted configuration. I have the ability to find out who changed it and when they access it. This is a lot of questions. You know, I use denormalized tables. Yeah, don't yell at me. I use good keys. Don't yell at me. Again, we're talking fifties in the row. It's not that big of a deal. Oh. And if you want to get really, really fancy with spices, you set them as memory tables. Um, but there, there's the setting at the environment. I'm sorry the demo doesn't. That, that was my PSP, the response or whatever that word is. Um, but, we, yeah, the problem with my API is that you turn the ID. You have to take the ID. So from a configuration standpoint, don't go to a centralized configuration service in which you want to. It has a really powerful sense of logic and secret and stuff to streamline. It's easy to force Docker containers. Uh, anytime you're doing like uh, service fabric in Azure, you're adding and removing instances on the fly uh, functions. They actually recommend using like for Azure functions, I think the land functions in AWS. Um, they recommend using some sort of configuration service because they're constantly coming live and going down. Um, that's great. Right. So from the enterprise standpoint, that's what it is. Um, the visibility piece can run anywhere. I like that. So you can put that in your log files, you stick wherever. That will save you your headings, power, and all the headings. Tools lock in between the contractor and the line. I know. You can get all your cards in configuration. So, that's that. Any other questions? You can put your board out of your phone. Well, no. Yes, there are. Um, not to that level. Not to the level that we're talking about with all your management pieces and your monitoring and auditing and encryption and all that kind of stuff built in. But if you don't need all those pieces, the recommended approach then is to use the Azure uh, Nougat package or the AWS Nougat package, depending on your, on your store, and wire that in. It has good, excellent documentation on both sites. And then your app then will just have the same thing. I'll have a connection string and a couple minor things you need to provide to them. And you pull out to get back in those configuration settings for me. You don't get all that management piece. You don't get all the auditing piece. You don't get the, the, the uh, repudiation piece. Those are, that's the best possible design for enterprises. But if you, if you want to go to a central configuration store, don't write your own. Use and you have access to the cloud. You use the cloud. Azure locks it down at the storage level. So basically, if you have access to the store, if you have access to everything, you can have a store for each environment. You can have a problem because now you have different settings and stage and stuff. So they're, they're a little bit late to the game and they're still for you. That seems pretty stable. We're in conversation with Microsoft and some of the development ones. But they're not willing to make the same bigger as what it is. Um, AWS has really good free capabilities. We have shared capabilities, which is really nice. They have the ability to lock down by specific other public. Keep the resource IDs. So if I can't access a certain key, 
that you can access it. So if I can't see the production, you can see the production. They have the ability to block all this. And that's, that's just how the box. And the cost of this thing, in the preview, Azure preview is free, but they're saying it's going to cost maybe a one thousand cent per tweet per lead. So maybe it just has to be. It's not going to be I don't know how to put it. I would recommend that you know, before you start writing your name. And I, I mean, that's that was intentional. I mean, you know, it has really powerful things. But you're gonna need to, you're gonna need to do that. You wanna find, if you're gonna find the, the Mount Everest, you're gonna have to be prepared to find Mount Everest to see the view. So if you're happy to go to Mount Rainier instead, a little shorter, and see about the same thing, then do that. Then you know, Mount Rainier, and then Mount Kilimanjaro. Sure. Oh, trust me. Yeah. Well, I got one. I got the edge. Um, so Sam, do you want to give away all the goodies?